Hello and welcome to the TPR Squared Certified Applicator Program Sprayer Training 101. This is uh, the same training that we do in person on site for spray foam contractors and distributors to help them understand the use of our thermal barrier coatings uh, as well as building codes and various different things they'll run into in the field when uh, applying spray foam insulation and coatings. A part of the training agenda will include product selection, We'll discuss equipment, we'll discuss material preparation, we're going to talk about foam surface considerations, how you measure the coating thickness, how you properly ventilate. There is a test at the end and there, typically in the on-site version there's a Q&A and hands-on spraying as well. At the end of the test will be, or at the end of the presentation rather, there's a test and all of the items that are bold and underlined in the presentation are answers to questions on the test. So you may want to pay special attention to those items in the slides. Okay, so let's get started. Which product um, would we use in a thermal barrier application over spray foam? Well, our version of a thermal barrier is, a, is called Fire Shell F10E, uh, also commonly known as TB. It does provide a 15 minute thermal barrier when applied over spray foam insulation. Most half pound and two pound spray foam insulation systems have been tested with this coating. Um, some have not, but uh, the vast majority that we see in the field are uh, tested and approved. Our ICC ESR report also is 3997. That is the document uh, that we have produced, or that ICC has produced for us, that includes an exhaustive list of all of the spray foam systems approved with our coating. F10E has a cure time of between two and three hours, depending on the ambient, temperature, humidity, and the ventilation system that you're using. It comes in pails and drums, and you will always recognize it by the red lid and the red banding on the label. F10E has many trade names, um, which are included on the label now. <clears throat> It goes, our, our in-house name for it is F10E and that is always going to appear on the label. It will also go uh, by JMTC, BMSTC, TB, and uh, a few other private label names like Blaze Lock uh, and various other names. But uh, if it comes from us uh, and it is a TPR2 product thermal barrier coating over spray foam, it is always the same product. It's F10E. That is also explained on our ESR report as well. So what is a 15 minute thermal barrier? A 15 minute thermal barrier is any material that separates the building components in the walls or ceilings from the occupied space where the inhabitants of the building are going to spend most of their time. It's designed to delay or prevent the temperature rise of those building components that, that actually make up the building structure. Uh, for 15 minutes and it is designed to prevent them from becoming involved in the fire. So it will delay the temperature rise and or prevent them from becoming involved in the fire entirely for a minimum of 15 minutes which just really allows occupants time to escape the fire. It is not designed to save the building, it's not designed to give the fireman time to get there to save the structure. It is literally a life safety code uh, coating. And the ESR report 3997 explains exactly what that is, explains exactly how much coating is required over various different spray foam systems. So that's really your reference document that you re rely on as the authority and that is also the document that a code official will rely on to verify if you're installing that properly. Okay, IB4 is an ignition barrier coating for use over spray foam systems as well. And then the F1E is an exterior grade ignition barrier coating. So the difference between IB4 or IB and the F1E is that one is designed for interior use, one is designed for exterior use. So the exterior grade F1E has additional UV inhibitors and weatherization testing. And it is approved for use over some different surfaces like wood, metal, and very, uh, a number of others. So there's a few additional tests and a few uh, additional raw materials in that product that make it suitable for exterior use. IBC and IRC will allow you to use an ignition barrier 
as an alternative to a thermal barrier. Now it's important to note that ignition barriers are a lesser level of fire protection than a thermal barrier. And IBC and IRC will let you use that lower level of protection, an ignition barrier, in particular areas like attics and crawl spaces, so long as the entry into those areas is only for the use and maintenance of uh, service of utilities. So air conditioners and various things like that that would be down there. It's technically not occupied space. It's not space that the building occupant is going to be accessing regularly. It's not storage. It has to truly be only for repair and maintenance of utilities and that's also specified in AC 377 Appendix X. So if you don't have a copy of the code, we can provide that to you as well. And that will explain exactly uh, what areas are approved and fall under that criteria. This brochure, uh, which is available from your TPR2 sales representative or our offices, will explain all the products in the fire shell uh, coating line, thermal barrier, interior ignition barrier and exterior ignition barrier and it kind of summarizes what we just walked through. Explains a few more uh, details about testing that's been performed and the back side of that has the product matrix uh, which will show you all the different spray foams that are approved and uh, that's a duplicate of the information on the ESR report. Okay, now we're going to discuss fire shell coating thickness. So you measure the coating thickness in mils which is one thousandth of an inch. Mills is not millimeters. Uh, mills does not mean one millionth of an inch. It means one thousandth of an inch. And as you can see in the photo, you can measure that with a caliper if you're measuring dry film thickness. Um, and we typically recommend measuring wet film thickness because that will give you a better indicator of um, thickness. And if you need to do some additional coats to get build up the thickness, obviously, you can do that when you're still there as opposed to after it's dried and um, you have to re-mobilize your, your workforce to come back and put an, another layer on that's far less convenient. So we also teach you how to measure wet film thickness. Typically F10E to achieve a thermal barrier is going to need to be installed between 18 and 26 wet mils that will dry down uh, to between 12 and 18 mils dry. Uh, to achieve a thermal barrier rating over spray foam. This is the back side of the brochure I referenced earlier that uh, also gives you the list of spray foam products and the required mill thickness and the required coating product. The ESR report also provides the same info. Specific thicknesses are determined by referencing that document. Any code official you encounter in the field will always want to see this document and they will reference it specifically and if there's a question about um, how much coating you're putting on, they'll reference this document and then go into the building and verify it. So this has always got to be on your rig or probably in your possession um, so that you can, you can answer the questions code officials may provide you in the field. When to install the coatings? This goes for all coatings, uh, all evaporative cure coatings. Essentially, it has to be hot and dry. Ambient temperatures need to be between 55 and 90 ideally, relative humidity between 40 and 60 percent or drier, and obviously hot and dry is the most favorable. Sprayers essentially need to be able to do around two gallon a minute delivery, and it's ideal if they can generate over 3,000 psi at the pump because depending on the length of hose and the diameter of your hose, you'll experience a pretty significant amount of pressure loss between the pump and the gun. That's just laws of physics. That's for every coating, not just ours. And we need to be able to maintain about 2,000 PSI at the gun. When you set up your sprayer for the first time, you'll want to verify that it has 30 mesh filters or larger in the gun. And you are going to want to leave the rock catcher attached at the bottom of the dip tube on the paint sprayer. Now, 30 mesh is a pretty large filter. Typically, the, the stock filters on your paint sprayers are going to be finer than that, but because of the solids loading in the uh, thermal barrier and ignition barrier coatings, that will cause you some problems uh, with clogging and pattern. So you want to put in 30 mesh uh, to catch the big things and you really want to let um, those smaller particles just flow right through. 
We like the Graco HD Texture Gun, which allows the material to flow through the, the trigger guard and not through the handle, but uh, more commonly you'll see a paint sprayer set up with the standard gun where the material flows through the handle and the filters in the handle, and that's fine too. Obviously cleanup, pretty simple. You flush your equipment with water. If you've been in the spray foam business for very long, you obviously understand that water is pretty much the enemy of all things related to spray foam. Um, and you probably don't have access to water on the rig or, or even would think about cleaning anything with water, uh, any of your spray foam equipment or guns. That's, that's not the case with our products. It's a water-based coating, so you can just flush your system with water. We would recommend that you do not use solvents or anything more uh, aggressive or caustic or corrosive than just plain water. The Graco Rack X 521 to 525 tip is the one we recommend. Um, 521 to 525, that would be a little bit larger tip than comes standard in most standard configurations. Again, this just allows some of the larger materials to flow through more freely and will reduce the clogging um, on the gun and it will make your pattern more reliable. I apologize for the graininess of this graphic, but I enlarged it to show um, the effect of wear, tip wear, on your pattern. So when your Graco Rack X or any other spray tip is brand new, that's going to give you the widest pattern. As you use that sprayer and there's uh, gallons of material end up going through this tiny orifice at the tip of the gun, that orifice gets reamed out or bored out because of the solids in the material being pumped. And so after 15, 30, 60, 155 gallons of material, you can see that the, the orifice has enlarged and the pattern has narrowed. And you wanna make sure that you're always using a new tip or something that's giving you a nice wide pattern because the machine is pumping the same amount of material every stroke. So if your, your pattern is more narrow, then that simply means you're, you're getting more coating in a smaller area and you could potentially be overloading the coating in a particular area or getting too too much coating uh, applying it too thick so that's going to require your sprayer to really adjust their speed of application and the atomization is not going to be as fine and so your coverage may not your hide may not be as good so a new tip is pretty important uh, and they're fairly cheap and inexpensive they're reversible and you just pop a new one in slide the old one out. So definitely recommend you keep that up to date. As far as personal protective equipment and accessories, again, if you are familiar with the spray foam industry, all of those same basic rules apply, um, except for we do not require fresh uh, supplied air respirator. We just require a normal respirator, um, like a cartridge mask. But whatever is typically good practice and required by OSHA and NIOSH, that would be the same things that would be required uh, to apply our products. The SDS will outline that as well. And obviously, if you're on a commercial project uh, or a project where the customer is requiring specific safety guidelines, you would have to follow those as well. Nine times out of 10, those will be above and beyond uh, what this list would require. Most of this is just required for cleanliness. Uh, there's nothing in the coating that's particularly toxic or dangerous. Um, unless you get it in your eyes or you ingest it. Skin contact is not necessarily a big deal uh, if it's washed off. Um, so this is more just for cleanliness and obviously the respirator. Uh, those fumes that you will experience as a part of the curing process of the coating, uh, they're not necessarily toxic, um, they're just irritant to your respiratory tract. So you're gonna wanna wear a mask and ventilate those fumes to the outdoors. Uh, that will enable drying and also just make the environment less hazy and more comfortable to work in. Okay, material preparation. The material in the bucket or the drum must be above 72 degrees, or I'm sorry, 62 degrees Fahrenheit. It should never have been frozen, and the mixer blade has to be greater than three inches for a pail and greater than six inches or equal to for a drum. That just enables you to get a good vortex mixing motion in the liquid um, when you're mixing. And the drill mixer that you see here is actually an air mixer. A standard electric drill mixer is adequate as well. Um, 
What you really want to do is mix the material, but you don't want to introduce air. So there's a, there's a particular speed and every situation will be different. You'll just have to pay attention. But if the material sits unused for an extended period of time, it will begin to settle and you'll get what's kind of a grayish translucent liquid forming on the top and the solids will settle to the bottom of the pail. So in the event that that happens, you're going to want to mix that for two to four minutes with the drill mixer or until you see the product has uniform color and viscosity. And you'll know. The solids will begin to work up off of the bottom. They will roll across the top uh, surface of the liquid and you'll see little chunks and you just need to continue to mix until those are all broken apart and mixed back into solution. During mixing you move the mixer head down to the bottom of the pail or the drum and you work in a clockwise motion around the outside perimeter of the container and that will make sure that no solids are left in the corners of the container. You want all of them mixed back up into solution. Again, you want the mixer speed to be fast enough to mix or shear the settled materials uh, back into solution, but you don't want it so fast it's going to introduce air or uh, froth up the coating while it's mixing because that will affect your pressures and application. If the material has been opened uh, and you didn't use an entire pail, you have a portion of a pail left over, it may form a skin or some solid cured material on the top surface and those can be filtered out using a standard door screen. Okay, pre-spray considerations and foam surface texture. It is really important for spray foam contractors to realize uh, the impact of cutting the foam versus leaving the skin on in terms of the, how much coating is going to be consumed on a particular project. If you cut the skin off of the foam, open or closed cell, you're going to consume potentially up to 40% more coating than if you left the skin on. Because what you've done is open the cells on the surface and the coating will absorb into those cells uh, at a much greater rate than if the skin was there providing uh, a non-porous surface to apply the coating to. Rough texture and crevices or bumps on the foam surface can also consume significantly more coating and probably will require back brushing. You can see in this photo that those little crevices and cracks in the foam surface are deep enough that when the coating was sprayed or applied over the, over the surface there, it missed some of these little crevices and yellowish foam is still visible. A coat official will come in and they will flag that. They will see that immediately and they will, they will determine that you've not done a good job of getting 100% coverage. Now no amount or it's unlikely that any amount of spraying will ever really get coverage down into those cracks because the way that a paint sprayer uh, uh, works is that it applies the coating under pressure atomized coating gets sprayed on under pressure and so it creates little vortexes as the coating um, hits the sides of those crevices so it's much easier to just have a brush and back brush those areas and try to minimize them as much as possible because if you try to spray those from every different angle what you'll do is you will overload on certain areas uh, of that and you could potentially have drips or runs where you have way more coating than you need and still haven't actually achieved 100% coverage down in the crevices. So back brushing uh, is often easier and consumes way less coating. When you are priming your sprayer, you need to make sure that the pressure on the pump is set to the lowest possible settings. That's just good practice and it makes uh, the initiation process safer. Now when you are spraying, the pump pressure needs to be set to 2200 PSI or higher depending on if you've got longer hose and you'll have to make that determination every setup and configuration is different. If you've got 50 feet of hose uh, you're going to need to set your pump to a different pressure than if you've got 300 feet of hose. Okay this is a video that shows proper spray technique uh, in a single pass. You'll notice that he is spraying at a very controlled, even rate, and he's probably going slower than you might imagine. Um, but the larger tip and the 
higher mesh screens really allow the chemical to flow out and the higher pressure impacts the delivery rate. So he's really putting on a nice 18, uh, 12 to 18 wet mills, I'm sorry, 18 to 20 wet mills most likely, which would dry down to 12 to 16 mils dry. Nice even coverage. This is over half pound material. And any areas that there would be a gap or a void, um, most likely he'd have a person coming behind him that could just hit him with a brush. That's a pretty nice application. Okay, the next video you'll see is 50% overlap. So the first one you saw was single pass and there was virtually no overlap, just enough to make sure you had uniform coverage. In this video you'll see he's gonna go 50% overlap. So he's gonna move faster because he knows he's coming right back over what he just sprayed and he's only moving 50%. This is a good technique if you have rough or uneven foam because it allows you to hit the foam at that one angle going one direction up and then another angle coming back down. So you can hit all sides of the surfaces, the bumps and the nodules on the foam. This video will show you a crosshatch technique. So when you have finished your initial coat, if the foam is particularly uneven and if you went fast enough uh, that you did not get adequate coverage or you intended to go fast enough so that you knew that you were going to come back and hit it again uh, because it's particularly uneven, this technique will allow you to go side to side as well. And this is a very light dusting. This is just to catch all the sides and uneven um, sides of the uneven bumps that exist in the foam surface. Again, very controlled speed. And he's trying to stay perpendicular to the wall and he's trying to um, almost be like a robotic sprayer. You really want to try to maintain as much uniformity in your speed and motion and technique as you can. And you'll see that he did have a little plug in the tip there. He just reversed the tip and triggered the gun quickly. He ejected the plug or the material that had plugged the tip and he went right back to spring. Measuring wet film thickness of the coating during the application. That's what we're going to discuss next. The wet film thickness is the measure of the thickness of the coating when it is still wet before it has dried and cured. Now measuring dry film thickness of the coating is what you do after the coating has cured and it requires a different set of tools and a bit different technique. So those are the two different methods that we're going to discuss. You can measure the dry film thickness after the, after the application also with the coupon comparison method. That would be the method we'd recommend or the slit sample which was shown before. Okay, dry film thickness is a measure of the thickness of the coating after it is dried. So you've got dry film thickness, wet film thickness. Those are the two. There is a difference between the two. Dry film thickness is always less than wet film because 40% of the coating is water. And that water evaporates as the coating dries and it leave beh leaves behind a solid film of material. Now that water must evaporate in order to, for the foam to cure or for the coating to cure. Um, and it evaporates into the atmosphere, the environment around in the room where you're applying the coating, which is why ventilation becomes very important because because there's so much water in the coating, it can be uh, difficult for the evaporation to take place once the air is saturated with water. So you want to 
ventilate the humid air out and ventilate uh, dry air in so that the, the evaporative curing process continues um, uninhibited. Now, why do we use coupons for the coating quality control? Coupons provide a flat surface, a smooth surface, to measure the wet film thickness accurately. It's also a hard surface. The foam is hardly ever flat enough or smooth or solid enough to use a wet film gauge, which are those little credit card size gauges with the teeth that have various different uh, stair step down at various thicknesses. The problem with even using a wood stud to be the flat surface is that the surface of those is often grainy and, and it's got the wood grain in it and it's not totally flat and they're also too soft. So you can um, press the, the wet film gauge into the wood slightly and get a false reading. That same issue exists with the spray foam too. Even if you had very, very flat spray foam, you could still push the gauge into the foam and you'd get a false reading. So they provide you with a flat, smooth surface to measure the accurate, measure the, the wet film thickness accurately. And they also provide a means by which to measure dry film thickness using a caliper. So we use those same coupons in wet film and dry film thickness measurement. We also leave coupons on the job site as evidence to inspectors and building owners that you have self-verified correct application thickness. Um, I particularly like this method because as a contractor, I usually left about 50% of the coupons on the project and I took the other 50% with me. And I would verify, I'd write project dates, the applicator name, the project name, and I would verify thickness on those and I'd write the thickness on the back and I had a file drawer full of those and it just provided me with some verification after the fact if it was ever in question I could always go get the coupons out of the drawer and say this was this project and I could show that I had self verified that I had put on the right amount of coating uh, at the end of the day and the, the code inspector really appreciated seeing this as well because what that told them was that we we had an awareness of the importance of getting the proper mill thickness in the coating and that we had been verifying it. If they don't see these, then, then the first question they will ask themselves when they come on site is how on earth does the applicator know how much, if they're getting the proper thickness of coating on? And the answer is they probably don't. Post spray inspection. Now make sure you've achieved even coverage from all angles. So. This looks like a pretty good even coverage with the exception of one spot, which looks like maybe it was caused by damage. Uh, however, if you turn that coating 90 degrees and look at it from the bottom side, now you see three, maybe four spots because the foam was uneven. It was difficult for the sprayer to get the foam down in the crevices. So you need to be looking at the foam from many different angles as the applicator because you know the code official is going to be viewing it from many different angles looking for these uh, gaps in coverage called holidays. This is pretty uneven foam right here and this is an example of a job that a code inspector would fail. They would say that that is not 100% coverage and they would require you to recode it and get rid of all of those holidays. This is another one where the foam coating is so uneven and it has so many pores in it that the code official would probably fail this because uh, they would just have a hard time believing that the coating had been uh, effectively made its way down into all of those crevices. This is an example of a coating project that would probably pass. Uh, coating is nice and even across the board. You don't see any wood. You don't see any big yellow spots where the foam is showing through. Okay. <clears throat> Negative pressure ventilation is required during and after the fire shell coatings in some places dehumidification will also be required. Ventilation is required because proper curing requires the evaporation of water into the air surrounding the coating as we discussed. And that air surrounding the coating can become saturated with water and uh, if, the, if it is saturated with water and the coating curing will slow down and it will prevent the coating from drying. If that takes place, then odors can linger long after the application is complete. So it's really important to exhaust that moisture-laden air from the area during the application. 
If the application area is sealed after the application, the moisture released from the coating will inevitably soak into drier building components like wood or other um, things up in that area and that will potentially cause lingering odors. So you really want to make sure that the coating is, is properly ventilated, the area is properly ventilated, and that moisture that's being released into the atmosphere is ejected from the building. This is a lesser concern, but obviously this also is a factor. The cure time will, will definitely be prolonged, and which means your recoat time is prolonged. Worst case scenario, you can actually experience a few adhesion issues, runs and drips, if the coating is not curing properly. Okay, where do I find this information again? Well, this sticker can be um, applied in your rigs. We have these available to all of our certified contractors. Um, you can stick this on the side of a toolbox or just on the wall inside of a spray foam rig and you can reach out to us anytime you have questions. If you look over here on the left, you've got application quick tips. This is a, this is a label that you would find on a drum or on a pail. Application quick tips are on the left, which recaps most of the uh, equipment settings and environmental settings that you're going to want to um, make sure are correct in order to successfully apply the coating. And then you've got uh, product features on the right. You also have a QR code up in the upper right hand corner, which takes you directly to our website. There are how to videos as well as an ESR report that you can download and our technical data sheet, which really covers in detail all of the factors related to successful application. Here's our tech data sheet. As we said, processing parameters are all right there in the big box on the front page. And obviously, you can contact us at TPR2 and your territory manager has all this information, hopefully in their brain, uh, but if not, at their fingertips, and they can get it to you right away. And obviously, our website is also probably one of the best resources that keeps up to that keeps everyone up to date on the best practices and updates on the products. Our certified applicator training program um, is a pretty good program. It includes a technical bulletin which will cover in greater detail most of the things we covered on this as well as cold storage procedures and a much more detailed uh, method for how to measure coating thicknesses in the field and also includes a PPE bag and a, a wet film gauge and then you also receive in the mail you'll receive a certified applicator card which you can carry in your wallet so that if you're ever stopped by a code official on a job site you can supply them with the card uh, they will be able to verify that you're certified to apply the coatings we have seen a couple instances around the country where code officials stopped projects because the applicators themselves were not trained properly or certified properly in how to apply the coating. And that coating is a life safety, fire safety issue. So to a code official, it's a very serious matter. And they want to make sure people putting on the coating, they know the thickness they're supposed to be applying it at, they're doing it at the proper equipment, with the proper pressures, with the proper procedures. So that card essentially is what you can show them to verify that you've been through the training and you know what you're doing. We obviously have a tremendous amount of support available uh, in the form of technical documents. We also supply custom colors. Some custom colors are going to um, take extra time and, and will incur extra cost, but we do offer white, gray, and charcoal black in stock at no extra charge. We also have standard blue and red and a few other colors that are extra charged, not stock items, uh, but, we, but we do have those colors worked out already. Custom colors are a bit more time and they'll, recolor, they will require you to get us a color swatch and then we'll make up small samples and get them back to you. Uh, and we do have minimum requirements for that. We also offer infield troubleshooting. We do architectural and code official training pro present presentations uh, regularly and throughout the country and then we also have our ESR report 3997 which includes all of our thermal barrier approvals. We also have dozens of very unique approvals on our thermal barrier for weatherization, um, tensile strength, FDA incidental food contact approvals, 
um, and a variety of other unique ones that most other thermal barrier coatings do not have. You can now log into the TPR2 Certified Applicator Program website and choose whether you would, you have to set up a username and password and then you can take the test, choose your English or Spanish version, complete the test and um, we hope you've enjoyed this and it's been informative. We look forward to uh, getting your test results and getting you your card back and meeting you very near future. Thank you.